Good morning, welcome. <clears throat> hey. Good morning. Welcome to Seven Run Worship. That was one way to get your attention. It's good to see all of you. Let's enter into our service with prayer. Please join me. God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you that you have called us to worship this morning. Lord, there is nothing more important, no act more greatly significant than the gathering of your people on Lord's Day to proclaim your praises and that you shall set the world to rights in the end, even by your bride through the head who is your son. We thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, that you are the king and head of us. Every judgment that you have given, we have found just and lovely and beautiful. We look forward till there is the full realization of your rule, not only in heaven, but upon earth. We ask, Lord, that as we remember your great deeds, that we would respond in the most appropriate way, and that is to glorify, adore, and praise your holy name and seek a renewed dedication to your will. We pray, Lord, that we would not only know your will, but we would obey it. We ask, Lord Christ, that you would send your Holy Spirit to us to accomplish these ends. On our own, we are not so capable. We ask, Lord Christ, that you would bring all of these things as the great steward of all of the cosmos unto the glory of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Let's stand for our call to worship from Psalm 67. God, be merciful to us and bless us, and cause his face to shine upon us, that your way may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Oh, let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you shall judge the people righteously and govern the nations on earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Then the earth shall yield her increase. God, our own God, shall bless us. God shall bless us, and all the ends of the earth shall fear him. Amen. Let's sing together, Come People of the Risen King.
Amen. Let us now behold Christ from 1 John 2, 12 through 17. I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you, little children, because you have known the Father. I have written to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Behold your Christ. Let us pray. Lord Christ, you have made us a people that are meant and have been commissioned and charged to be the light of the world. But Lord, when we survey our lives even a little, we see that sometimes we contribute to the darkness of the world. But Lord, this is no longer what makes our hearts beat. For you have renewed our souls and spirits. And therefore, Lord, we enter into a time of confession that we may remember who we are and who you are. We pray that you would be merciful to us by sending your spirit to convict us of sin, to take us out of the captivity of the devil, and to lead us into full repentance. And we ask that you would do so through your chosen means, the elder. We ask that you would work through him as an instrument to bless your church. In the name of Christ, amen. amen. You may be seated. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Today, during this confession of sin period, we're going to focus on the uh, seventh commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. I'm going to start with uh, Jesus' weighty words on the subject from Matthew chapter 5. Our Lord says, You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. As you can see from our Lord, this is a very serious issue. I want to briefly mention the, what the larger, larger catechism has to say on, on this. What are the, in Q138, what are the duties? Just going to read a little bit of it for, for you. The duties required in the seventh commandment. They are chastity in body, mind, affections, words, and behavior, and the preservation of it in ourselves and others watchfulness over the eyes and all the senses, and resisting temptation for all this. What are the sins forbidden in the seventh commandment? Beyond the obvious ones like fornication, all unclean imaginations, thoughts, purposes, and affections, all corrupt or filthy communications or listening thereunto, immodest apparel, lascivious songs, and so on. As you can see from our Lord's words here, it goes to our, our eyes and our thoughts, not just the actual, we must not, first of all, be like the Pharisees and think that we're holy just because we're not actually committing the act of adultery. God forbid. I can do no better than read, read, the, Lord's, uh, read the Holy Spirit's words here. So I'm going to read you a few excerpts to understand the gravity of this sin. Starting in Ephesians 5, starting in verse 5. Or verse 3, sorry. 
But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you, as is proper among saints. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. And a similar passage from Colossians 3, starting in verse 5. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. And lastly, a passage from 1 Corinthians 6, starting in verse 9. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God, and such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. And then down closing that chapter, down later, starting in verse 18, the command is to flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that the, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price so glorify God in your body. Do you see the, the gravity, the weight, the seriousness of this issue? There is, a, there is a cancer, there is a cancer in the world, there's a cancer in the church, it's malignant, it continues to grow, and it's pretty much ubiquitous, and I'm talking about the cancer of pornography and the associated sexual immorality that uh, destroys lives, that destroys families, that destroys marriages, and that destroys churches. You see the weight of these words from the Holy Spirit. It destroys souls. It destroys your very soul, and it jeopardizes not only your life, but where you're going to spend eternity. I can do no better than read you the scriptures of the Holy Spirit today. So let's go to the word. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we confess our sins in this area. Let's pray. Our Father, we have much to confess here. Father, we confess that we are not pure we confess that we are not holy as you call us to be holy. We confess that our eyes have lusted, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes. We confess that our thoughts are impure. We confess that we have looked upon other women, other men, whatever you are, Father, as you commanded not to do. We are guilty before you today of the sin of adultery against you, our Savior. Father, your will is this, our sanctification. Your will is that we abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of us know how to control our own bodies in holiness and honor not in the passion of lust, like the Gentiles who do not know you. 
Father, your will is that we are not to transgress and wrong our brother and our sister in this matter, because you, Lord, are an avenger in these things. You know all things, Father. You know our hearts. You know our thoughts. You have not called us to impurity, but to holiness. May we not disregard these commands from you, because they are, not from, they are from you, and you have given us your Holy Spirit to resist. So, Father, I, we ask for your forgiveness for our sin. We pray for the strength to resist, particularly those of us who have fallen into this most egregious sin of pornography, of viewing what we should not view. Strengthen us, Father, that, that your Holy Spirit within us may give us the strength to live lives of purity and honor to you. This is our prayer today. Now let us each confess our sins individually. We thank you, Father, for hearing us. We know that if, if you are our Lord and Savior, you have forgiven us, Father, that there is no sin beyond your forgiveness. We are so thankful, Father, for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Now hear this assurance of pardon from 1 Peter. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. That indeed is good news, brothers and sisters. The Lord has abundant mercy, and he is saving for us a wonderful inheritance. Let us stand and sing hymn number two, By Faith. It's been a little while since we've sung this hymn, so I just want to remind everyone, we'll sing the refrain after verses two, four, and five.
remain standing as the usher comes forward as we sing the doxology. pray. Our Father, this indeed is your world. We thank you, Lord, that your Son has all authority in heaven and on earth. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we offer you these, our tithes, our offerings, as a thank you for what you have done in our lives. May you use these offerings to build up your kingdom in tangible ways for your Son's sake. Amen. remain standing for the word. Children three and under are dismissed to the nursery. Let's open our scriptures to Judges chapter 16. Our reading this morning will be 1 through 22. Judges 16, 1 through 22. Now Samson went to Gaza and saw a harlot there and went into her. When the Gazites were told, Samson has come here, they surrounded the place and lay in wait for him all night at the gate of the city. They were quiet all night, saying, In the morning, when it is daylight, we will kill him. And Samson lay low till midnight. Then he arose at midnight, took hold of the doors of the gate of the city and the two gateposts, pulled them up, bar and all, put them on his shoulders, and carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. Afterward, it happened that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, Entice him, and find out where his great strength lies, and by what means we may overpower him, that we may bind him to afflict him. And every one of us will give you eleven hundred pieces of silver." So Delilah said to Samson, Please tell me where your strength lies and with what you may be bound to, be, to afflict you. And Samson had said to her, If they bind me with seven fresh bowstrings not yet dried, then I shall become weak and be like other men. So the lords of the Philistines brought up to her seven fresh bowstrings not yet dried, and she bound him with them. Now men were lying in wait, staying with her in the room, and she said to him, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he broke the bowstrings as a strand of yarn breaks when it touches fire. So the secret of his strength was not known. 
Then Delilah said to Samson, Look, you have mocked me and told me lies. Now please tell me what you may be bound with. So he said to her, If, you, if they bind me securely with new ropes that have never been used, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. Therefore Delilah took new ropes and bound him with them and said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And men were lying in wait, staying in the room, but he broke them off his arms like a thread. Delilah said to Samson, Until now you have mocked me and told me lies. Tell me what you may be bound with. And he said to her, If you weave the seven locks of my head into the web of the loom. So she wove it tightly with the batten of the womb and said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he awoke from his sleep and pulled out the batten and the web from the loom. Then she said to him, How can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? You have mocked me these three times and have not told me where your great strength lies. And it came to pass when she pestered him daily with her words and pressed him so that his soul was vexed to death, that he told her all his heart and said to her, No razor has ever come upon my head, for if I have been a Nazarite, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I am shaven, then my strength will leave me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. When Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up once more, for he has told me all his heart. So the lords of the Philistines came up to her and brought the money in their hand. Then she lulled him to sleep on her knees and called for a man and had him shave off the seven locks of his head. Then she began to torment him, and his strength left him. And she said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as before at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. Then the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza. They bound him with bronze feathers and he became a fetters and he became a grinder in the prison. However, the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaven. Amen. Let us pray. Oh, Lord, what a picture of your church and your faithfulness. Pray, Lord, that you would call us to faithfulness, that we might be like you. Let us be hearers of your word and doers. In the name of Christ, amen. You may be seated. Last week, we acknowledged a basic reality, which is this. Despite all of the carnage and tragedy and chaos on the surface of human endeavors, God, though camouflaged or hidden, is there accomplishing his good purposes. I wonder if you have seen that in your own lives, God accomplishing his good purposes. This morning, we come to perhaps the most familiar part of the Samson episode with Samson and Delilah. We'll start by making a few observations, and then I have three main uh, applications this morning to really get to the heart of what we need to hear. So here's the first thing that I want you to notice, and it's the first four verses which are really set off and act as a kind of seasoning so that we can understand the, the narration. Uh, the narrator demonstrates once again that Samson is stronger than a lion. That's important for us to remember. The Philistines thought that brute strength and strategic advantage would put an end to Samson, but they were wrong again. They tried to cage him behind the city gates in verse 3, but he arose at midnight, took hold of the doors of the gate of the city and the two gate posts, pulled them up, bar and all, put them on his shoulders and carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. That did not work. That strategy did not work. It has never worked to seek to overcome him by totalitarian strength. Which brings us to the second thing I want you to notice, or the second observation. Now, you already know this. You know the key that unlocks the secret of the story. Samson is, in fact, stronger than a lion, but we know that there's a question that comes along with that. But what is sweeter than honey? Well, for Samson, it's Philistine women. And so in verse 4, you see Samson meets Delilah, and you already know what is going to happen at this point. He will give up his strength. It's just a matter of building suspense by the narrator 
as we see it unfold little by little in the same structure that we saw with the Timnite woman with him, her asking questions and pestering him. You can see right away that the Philistines intend to trap Samson with her. In verse 5, they call on Delilah. Essentially, they're saying, are you a Philistine or not? And then, and then to help her make up her mind, they offer her an, an enormous amount of money. I mean, she's going to win the Powerball at this point. Seriously. This time, however, as opposed to when they were working with the Timnite woman, they're not interested in solving a single riddle for 30 pieces of clothing. They want to know the riddle of Samson's strength so that they can overtake him. And that's what she sets out to do. You see repetitive scenes building more and more in suspense, asking the question, really, in the background, all of us feel this, will Samson eat the honey and give up his strength? And maybe you're asking, when will he? Because it certainly will be done, but when will it happen? Well, it's, it's a great tragedy, but a, a, a brilliant piece of literature. And so you see the different iterations. Uh, will it be fresh bowstrings, verse 8, for example? That's going to be fresh tendons from an animal. There's a lot to say about that with him taking a Nazarite vow and touching dead things again. But will it be fresh bowstrings, verse 8, that overcomes Samson? What does she find out? Nope. Will it be new ropes that act as a kind of kryptonite in verse 11? Nope. Will it be something woven with the locks of his hair? Well, we're getting close, but no cigar, right? So once we arrive at it's, um, these final verses in the repetitive scenes, we realize that he does reveal the riddle, and so too does Delilah. She, you could almost see it on her face by way of your imagination, where she realizes he's telling me everything. She handles the whole thing differently. The narrative at this point fills up with Delilah's actions, if you notice. Then she lulled him to sleep, to sleep on her knees, and called, she called, there's all these verbs associated with her, she's getting to work, and called for a man, and had him shave off the seven locks of his head, then she, be, then she began to torment him, and his strength left him, and she said, the Sam Philistines are upon you, Samson, and so he awoke from his sleep and said, He'll go out as before, but he did not realize that the Lord had left him. Now from here, I hope you notice the dramatic reversals from the whole story that the now, now the Philistines will afflict on him. Samson lived by his eyes, taking whatever was right in his own eyes. Verse 21, the Philistines gouge out his eyes. Samson would roam freely like an untamed beast, now he is led in bronze fetters wherever he goes, like a domesticated animal. Samson, in his strength, set the Philistine agricultural grain economy on fire, and he tore down their barred city gates, and now he grinds grain behind prison bars as a slave. It's all a dramatic reversal, falling back on his own head, what he had done. Quite ironic. This brings us to observation number three. Now, and this is really where the, the heart of the story is. To see the message in this part of the Samson cycle, you must pay attention to a key word that we would just read over as if it did not matter, and it is the word began. I want to give you just a couple examples, and you're welcome to look at the scripture with me and, because I'm going to start in chapter 13 of this same book, and we're going to work our way up to this episode, just looking at the word began at key points. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come upon his head. This is 13 verse 5, I apologize. Judges 13 5. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come upon his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hands of the Philistines. So there you see the action set in motion, or the idea of it. We can then move to Judges 13, verse 25. And the Spirit of the Lord began to move upon him at Mahana Dan between Zorah and Eshtaol. Then we go to Judges chapter 16, verse 19. Then she lulled him to sleep on her knees and called for a man and had him shave off the seven locks of his head. 
and here's where the reversal is, then she began. You see that? To torment him, and his strength left him. The narrator is obviously doing something here. And then our final one is Judges 16, 22, and this is the most important. Now, for our, uh, however, the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaven. You can see the whole plot of the whole story by just following the words begin and began. It's marvelous. And it ends up bringing us to this timeless truth, this doctrine, this heavenly doctrine, and it is this. When the church is canonized, it is shaved of its strength. Now, we've heard that over and over again in different ways, but here it is again. When the church is canonized, it is shaved of its strength, but here it is. Yet in God's mercy, guess what? Hair grows back. Hair grows back. When the church is canonized, it is shaved of its strength, yet in God's mercy, hair grows back back. I have not heard a more hopeful message. <laughs> That's lovely. And of course, I'm talking about God's kingdom, not your own hair, men. Um, I don't know if it will ever grow back or not, but you see what we're doing. So I want to draw this out in three different ways this morning, and it's this wisdom for the church, questions for the church, and gifts for the church. Wisdom for the church, questions for the church, and gifts for the church. So let's go ahead and unfold this. When the church is canonized, it is shaved of its strength, yet God and God's mercy hair grows back. Starting with wisdom for the church. Now I'm going to get you to turn to another part of Scripture with me today because I think it's so important to look at this Samson episode through another lens. It's, if we look at it through Proverbs chapter 31, verses 1 through 9, it's going to be like adding some salt to a good steak. It's not going to ruin the steak. It's going to bring out the flavors if you do it right. So what we're going to do is turn to Proverbs 31, 1 through 9. I'm going to read that to you and then just draw a few or make a few remarks about it because it's going to be really helpful as we understand our role as a church. There's wisdom for us here given to us by the eternal Christ. In this passage, Proverbs 31, 1 through 9 there is a special woman, and her words are recorded. It's uh, King Lemuel's mother, and she should be heard in light of our Samson reading. Here it is. The words of King Lemuel, the utterance which his mother taught him. Think about her in relationship to Samson's mother. A lot of similarities. What, my son, and what son of my womb, and what son of my vows? Do not give your strength to women nor your ways to that which destroys kings. It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes intoxicating drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the justice of all the afflicted. Give strong drink to him who is perishing and wine to those who are bitter of heart. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. Open, but, but you, Lemuel, essentially, open your mouth for the speechless in the cause of all who are appointed to die. Open your mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and needy. So I encourage you that if you get a chance uh, over lunch or whatever it is, even throughout the rest of this week, for you to look at this 1 through 9 in Proverbs 31 relative to the whole Samson episode, you could really do it with, with judges more largely if you have quite the imagination. But just with the Samson episode, it could really result in some great conversation. Now here's a few remarks that will be helpful to you, I hope. I want you to notice that the mother in Proverbs warns the king to not give up his strength to women. Now you obviously made the connection right, just like Samson, okay? So, yet, what we end up seeing in this poetic parallelism of this proverb is that women are just a token example of anything which destroys kings. He's, she's essentially instructing him, don't be involved with things that make you weak, specifically with relation to your job as the king. So a little later, this could include wine or really anything which intoxicates making the king weak. That's the whole point. Don't be involved in things that take you away from your strength. That's the first thing I want you to notice. The second thing is this, is that weakness is defined in verse 5. 
of this proverb. Take a look at that. Whatever lessens the king ability, king's ability to establish justice must be avoided. You see that right there? The problem with these things that make him weak is he can no longer understand God's order and pronounce it over society. He himself becomes corrupted or lulled to sleep on a lap like Samson. And that can happen through his becoming intoxicated with various things, for example. So I'll remind you that when we talk about judgment like this, the exercise of justice and judgment, we are not just talking about an intellectual matter. It is a matter of taking disorder and instead being like God, like he was at creation, and making it rightly ordered in every sphere of life. Now, when we get to David, eventually, some sermon series, you'll see that's one of the first things that he did, was he wiped out the Philistines in order to reestablish order, and everyone was thankful. And he called that his judgment and his justice. We, around here, have talked about it in terms of a sheriff. It's the same idea, getting order in every sphere of life. And that is what Samson, if you remember, was supposed to do with his strength. But he did not. He became intoxicated by various things, didn't he? The Philistines were exploiting the poor. We've seen that throughout Judges. Samson was to see the wrong, and he was to make it right, and he was given the strength to do it. But instead, he gave up his strength to women and to intoxicating sweetness, whatever his eye saw. Now, when we take Proverbs 31 and we look at it, we look at the Samson episode, there's a great deal of wisdom that, that starts to show up there, and it leads us to our second point, which is questions for the church. As soon as you add that salt from Proverbs 31 to the Samson episode, episode, there are these flavors that are going to emerge that we can put into the form of questions that are meant to be very helpful to you. For example, let me just say a few things about this. Questions for the church. We, therefore, as the church, knowing our inclination to things which take away our strength or shave our heads, we must continually ask in each generation, are we giving up our strength? And this is exceptionally difficult and requires more honesty than we sometimes have. Because if you notice in the Proverbs passage, both women and wine are creational good gifts from God. And yet when we use them, we use them to weaken us because we misuse them. So it becomes really difficult sometimes to discern this. Like I could come up to you and I could say, look, brother and sister, you're becoming weak. And you could say, well, show me what I'm doing wrong. <laughs> and then you would point to all these things that are good gifts from God. And you're going to have to end up taking further steps than that to get to the wisdom of someone who might confront you in those kind of things. Because they're obviously seeing a weakness. So th this is where it can become tricky, but I'm going to hopefully through like general instruction uh, orient us to this so we can start asking the question. In every generation, we must ask the question, are we giving up our strength? Are we letting something shave our head? The seven locks, the perfect locks of our head. Now, let me put it this way. The story of Samson ends up giving two options in how the church loses its strength. The church will lose its strength first when a totalitarian regime forces it into weakness. And of course, what we see over and over again in Judges is that with Samson, that does not work because he is always stronger than the lion of the tyrant. The other method, which tends to be true throughout all of history, though there are special examples, the other method that is always more effective for Samson is that they get him through honey and sweetness. Seduction, essentially. Weakness through seduction. Spinning that beautiful wine in the glass is a way that the scriptures end up talking about it. And the same th happens to the church. Perhaps raw power and coercion is on the doorstep of the church. I'm sure it is already in some countries, 
but it still seems that our major weakness, especially as the American church, is going after the swirling wine and the intoxicating pleasures of the world to the point where we are impotent. Now, as soon as you say something like that, one of the qu other questions that we have to ask and questions for the church is, well, how in the world do we discover what is shaving our beautiful locks? We have to ask the question in many ways. Here this morning, all we're learning is that we should ask it in light of Proverbs and Samson. What keeps the church from doing her job of setting the world to rights, especially for the poor and the needy? If there's disorder in the world, guess what means God has given under the authority of Christ to bring order? It is the church. Christ himself has authorized us to bring order to the disorder. So then you ask the question, well, what is, what is the church doing and is it doing that? And if not, how did it become impotent? What is causing it to not be able to do it? That can be a complicated answer, but sometimes it can become simple. You could, for example, ask the question by way of James. James puts it this way. He says, what keeps us from practicing pure and undefiled religion? Now, we've said over and over here at Severn Run, I feel like I'm beating a drum, but that could be a negative image of me pestering you or it could be um, that I still want you to go to war. Like it's a war drum, keeping you moving forward and keeping your pace up and reminding you what we're doing. Like someone with a flag out in front, making everybody crest the hill even though they're weak. And I think that's the drum here, is that we have said over and over here at Severn Run that if you want to know what makes American Christians weak, it is the American Pharaoh. Now there are many other things that make us weak, but this is the prime one. The American Pharaoh, the Pharaoh of American culture keeping the church so busy that the church has no time or energy to do her real job of being neighborly. Even though we have been given a holy day wherein we are to offer resistance called the Sabbath or the Christian Sabbath, it is still the major problem for the church that there's no time for her to do her real job. This is so convicting to me. I was talking about this as Holly was making us some eggs and bacon this morning because we had some glorious time this morning before we had to be to church, no Sunday school. And we were just turning this over, just thinking about how the American Pharaoh makes it where we just have no time or energy left to do anything that God has asked us to do, or, or some of the things that God has asked us to do. And this ends up being the cycle over and over again. The church and her children, the church will educate her children. And during this time of school, there's no time for anything else. It's just education. And we think about, okay, but it's like fertilizing a plant, and pretty soon we're going to have shade and fruit from this tree. We just have to be patient. That is the work of education. And then, to add to that, we as families start adding recreational sports to education because we all have to have a kind of health class, at least that's how we justify it. And then there's definitely no time, and, and we think, okay, but it will give fruit somehow here in the future. And then the children, full of strength and vigor and education, they graduate from university, <clears throat> and they start their own families, or they've already entered into their a vocation through woodworking or mechanical arts or whatever it is, and they start their own families and they buy a house and they get cars and they have kids and then they educate their kids and we don't have any time to do anything because we're educating. And I have this truck that I have to pay off and this house that I have to pay off. And you see the cycle. And everyone is so tired that all we have left is a little bit of heart to start a Netflix show and fall asleep during it. And that ends up being a pretty good picture of the struggle with the American Pharaoh. So we're asking the question as Jesus would ask it when we look at all of those things. Now listen, folks, I love you, but this question is subverting. 
What is the fruit of the trees of our families and our schools? Tell me the great things that we are accomplishing. Now, there are some great things. There are some great things. But when you look at the percentage of the time given to particular things and then you look at the fruit, it's like, maybe this isn't worth it. Some people say that to me about Maryland blue crabs, which I don't understand. You take all this time to pick this thing and you get, you get this little bit of meat. Maybe that's a similar picture here. I mean, maybe it's a sign of how Christ might be viewing us and the way that we have spent our time in the system in which we're working. What is the fruit of the trees of our families and our schools? What are our children accomplishing? And what percentage of our children are actually accomplishing it? Now, those are some questions for the church. Those are very convicting, and they are working on me. I'm having trouble sleeping. The final thing I'll mention to you is I just want to remind you, which is another drum that I keep beating, and it is the gift for the church. So we have had the wisdom for the church. From that wisdom, certain questions arise that we have to take seriously. And then there is this gift of the church, which presses the questions even more seriously upon our conscience. And the gift was this. It was COVID. And it was social unrest, all happening in a giant chaotic ball. What he did is that he tore the mask off of American culture, showing that we have no right to put our implicit trust in government, science, or universities. Now, you've heard me say that before. I think all of those things are a gift, and they still have a measure of gift about them. I'm not an anarchist. But we are not to put our implicit, unquestioning trust within those things. That's something that we learned. We learned that actually, though their, hung, their, their speech is like honey, their throats are full of deceit. And we see what the real plan is. And that we ship our children off to these places and we watch them wither away and have no strength. Actually, they do have strength, but no longer for Christ. They officially work for Satan. That was something that came out of COVID. And there were so many other lessons that I fear that we're beginning to, to lose the lesson. As COVID fades away, this gift that God gave to us across the globe, the whole church, not one corner of the earth. The whole church was given the lesson. But as this lesson fades away, the church is tempted to return to the systems which the world has set up for its own ends. And here is the great question that is before the church across the globe. When and what will God need to do in order for the hair to grow back? Because we have been weakened for so long as a church. The question in the air is, what will God need to do for the hair to grow back? He showed us that we were weak. He showed us why. And if we return to the systems, it will just be another shaving. Or could this be a time when the hair grows back? Now, I'm certain that it will because God is faithful. I see so much that God is doing with, in your individual lives, your family lives, your corporate lives, the great good that comes out of the various uh, schools that are a part of this congregation. There is a lot of good news going on, but, but this is set up because of the passage that we're dealing with for us to be sobered this morning. Is God working on your family or on your generation to do something different? That's, what I, that's the question. Is God doing something in your family or in your generation to do something different than the status quo? I want to know which of you will be the great reformer. 
Now that's exciting. Now is the time. Which of you is going to be the great reformer? How many of you will join together to reform? Which of you, for those of you who are edgy, will be the rebel? Which of you will disrupt and subvert the satanic order? Now, there was an example of this that just happened, not of a subversion of the satanic order. It's just an example of subversion. Did anybody get a chance to see on the news or on social media the two young ladies who decided to uh, try to subvert Western civilization by throwing a, a tomato soup on the Van Gogh painting uh, sunflowers? They then uh, took super glue, put it on their hand, and they glued themselves to the wall. Everybody, everybody know this happened? Some of you look shocked. Okay. <laughs> so what were they doing? Were they angry about the painting? No. They, it was all symbolic. They're throwing the tomato soup on the painting as a subversion to the priorities of Western civilization. When they had the opportunity to give their sermon there at the painting, they said, you take the time to preserve paintings, but you do not preserve the earth. And they're upset about oil. Now, I'm not saying that is what we're supposed to do. We have a, maybe sometimes, but that's not largely the ordinary work of the church to do those kinds of protests or subversion, but that is a picture. Do you see what it is? It is a picture of one order and mode of being in life against another mode and order of life. And we are in the exact same position, and the large question looming in the air this morning is, are you just going to integrate with the world and its system and lose your strength? Or are you going to take all those tomato cans that you have in your, I don't know, those holes you dig for the zombie apocalypse? I know you all are storing t uh, dry goods. You get the idea. I don't want to take the analogy any further because I don't want to be seen as an anarchist. I don't think what they did was right. I'm just pointing out to you that we are to be a disrupting and a subverting people. Now, here's the good news. This is already happening among you. God has given you low-hanging fruit. If you just raise your families to where you teach your girls that they are girls and boys that they are boys, you're already subverting our culture. But there is so much more. Well, let me ask you. Is the American culture satisfied for you to have your family to yourself, or do they want it? And that'll be the decision for you. Are you going to be subversive in this Christian way? Will you be disruptive in this Christian way using Christian weapons, not weapons of the world? And these were the lessons that we were supposed to learn from COVID. He took the mask off of all of it. If you were to turn to James at another time, you would see that COVID was like a mirror. And we looked at ourselves in it, and he showed us in that trial the weaknesses of the church and how we had become weak. And James's great question to the church is this. When you turn away and the trial is gone and you're no longer facing the mirror, will you forget what I showed you? Or will you not only be hearers of the word that I have given to you for years now, will you also be doers? That is the one major question before the face of the global church. Will you do what I have revealed in my word? And I'm telling you, it is time. I stand here as a pastor, prophetically speaking from his word, that it is time to do what you have heard. What did you see in the mirror? What did you see? Do not forget what you saw, but go off and do. What did he reveal to you? What wisdom did he give you? What work should we be getting to work on? I do not want us to prove that we have already forgotten. I don't want us to move from the Tim Knight woman to Delilah. When the church is canonized, it is shaved of its strength 
Yet in God's mercy, hair grows back. It is always the case. And if you want to have your hair continually shaved off, I'm telling you, your future is that God is going to remove you. You heard Joe say it this morning. There is a certain group that will be permitted into the kingdom of heaven, on earth as it is in heaven. If you want to continually turn your back on him, you will prove yourself to never have belonged to him. I encourage you this morning instead to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Learn the lessons. I wonder which of you will not just be hearers of the word, but doers, practicing true religion, bringing order and justice to your various spheres of influence, even in little ways. I know that's where your heart is. This is a gospel sermon. I know that Christ has changed your heart and you want to do this, and I am seeking to stir you up to good works today. Perhaps you could start with something simple. There's a tragedy present in Severn Run. Our widows are lonely. Maybe we could visit them. What choices will you make to let the hair start to grow back. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, these words bounce off of the wall and come back onto me. Lord, I am a hearer today and not just a preacher. This is the word for all of us that you have given us. Lord, I pray that you would not allow your congregation to view me as the party pooper. Everybody was enjoying their bourbon or whatever, and I came in and said, sober up. I pray, Lord, that you would see this, that they would see this as your call to them that you are serious and that you still walk among the lampstands of your churches. Lord, I don't care how many people we have in this congregation. If we're not doing anything, we are lifeless. I pray, Lord Jesus Christ, that you would bring new hair growth here at Severn Run. I pray that you would release us from the temptations of the devil and all of the distractions and temptations and the sweetness of the American system that once you get in, there's just no time for anything else. Lord, I pray that you would pronounce a decree from heaven that the God of this age who controls America would let your people go. Let my people go that they may worship me. I pray, Lord, that there will be a great exodus. I ask, Lord, that you'd take your word and you'd make it effectual thereunto. In the name of Christ, amen. 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 Let us stand for our invitational hymn, Lamb of God, and I'd ask the elders to please prepare the table.
Let us give thanks for this table. God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for your only begotten Son, whom you gave to us. Lord Christ, we thank you for giving yourself, even while we were still sinners. Lord Christ, we ask, as we sang earlier, that we would live by faith and not by sight at this table, especially. That we would see that this bread and this wine is set apart from its common usage, and it is now has a sacramental use, that we are by faith to see the new covenant and the benefits which you have conferred for your bride, the great liberties and the great call. I ask these things in your name. Amen. This is the table of the Lord Jesus Christ. You could read anywhere throughout the scriptures and find him because the scriptures are all about him. You could take King Lemuel and his mother, for example. Christ, even under the greatest distress, never gave in to the seduction of the world. You can look through the Gospels to see the kind of temptations that have, he's been under. He did not uh, succumb to the totalitarian regimes of the world, but remained faithful to his Father's will for the salvation of the church. He has all authority in heaven and earth, and this is his table that he has authorized. So this is the first thing that I need to let you know. Christ has said clearly that this table is meant to be a means of grace only to his people, those who are the Christian people. This is for them and not for the non-Christian. If you are not a Christian, you belong to a different world order that is at enmity with Christ and his order. And therefore, you may not sit here as if you're his friend. You will only prove yourself to be like Judas, betraying him, selling him for money like Delilah did to Samson. But here is the great good news that is still going out. I am in marvel at the patience of God. And yet here he is today, still not having brought his judgment to bear, which means he is still in the mode of patience. And those of you who are not Christians, please speak to us while God is still patient with you that you might receive mercy from his hand, that you would be brought into his order, that you would be his child. We have a warning given to us in 1 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse 27, that helps us to know how to manage the table. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many die. And so there is the warning that the Apostle Paul himself has given to us. So if you are not a Christian, if you're a part of that other order, I encourage you to speak to myself or one of these men, or a Christian that you know is living for Christ and is probably disrupting your life. <laughs> for those of you who are Christians, this table is yours. Christ intends this morning, the intent of our commander is that you would be strengthened by the bread and by the wine. It's not enough for you to be strengthened as if we sat down for a fried chicken dinner. You are to be strengthened by faith, to remember what it means to be members of the new covenant under Christ, what he confers upon us in the deliverance of his Pentecostal spirit, the spirit that he gave at Pentecost. In this bread and in this wine is a great call. It is a call that Christ himself has gone through and completed perfectly on our behalf that we might exist in the status of holiness and righteous before the Lord. That is what is written across your forehead, so to speak, being in Christ. But it is also a call for you to be like your Christ who gave up his life for the world to change the world. 
Now, when we talk about you disrupting society, this is not an easy task. This means that you will be ridiculed, that you will have to give an account for why you don't play in championship football games on the Lord's Day, for example, or whatever it is. Those are small examples. But you will be ridiculed, and you will be asked to lose your life in order to save it. But here is the great news is you will become a living testimony of a different order and a different kingdom that has come into the world, and Christ will use the testimony to draw people to himself and to his kingdom. It is the church's witness. So as Christ is here a witness today, he calls us to be a witness today. And may we consider all these things as we partake of the bread and the wine and more as you spend time with him. We'll begin with the distribution of the bread, and then we'll give the words of institution. We'll take these together as a family. The small bowl of bread is gluten-free. Thanks. When we take this sacrament, we are announcing that a new order has entered the world and is taking over. It began as small as a mustard seed on the city streets of Jerusalem, and it is now a tree so large it is taking over the world, and all the birds shall nest in it and find their food. That is the image. This is what we are a part of as we by faith partake of Christ or commune with him by way of the Spirit. 
For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us take and eat. Lord, our history is that you created all things good and then we twisted them. But Lord, you did not leave us in the estate of sin and misery, nor did you leave your creation to degrade and decreate, but you have sent the Lord of creation to take upon himself human nature to redeem his creation to redeem us, his creatures. And now the sons of God are being revealed that the creation has been longing for. That under you, Lord Jesus Christ, as the great Adam, ruler of heaven and earth, shall stand as you are proclaimed prophetically in Psalm 8, above all things, ushering all of creation to the glory of the Father. It is your order that shall prevail. And here, Lord, we celebrate this as we see the lengths that you have gone to for the redemption and the purchasing of that which belongs to you. We thank you, Christ, and may we remember at what a great cost we have been purchased. Lord, keep us from temptation and from the works of the devil. Keep us and let us be unspotted from the world. Amen. 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 We also will distribute the cup now. The clear glasses and the outer rings are wine. The center portion in the color glasses is grape juice. And we'll take this together as a family also. Thank you, brothers.
Before I read the words of institution, as we have the cup before us, it is good to remember by way of this sign and seal that it at the very least signifies that you have been purchased by the blood of Christ. That is the cost of your redemption. He has therefore set us aside as members of His body, His holy temple. It's like those pictures in the Old Testament where a, a normal utensil is then brought into holy service only to be used in that temple. It's now sacred, and you too have become holy. And as we take the wine, may we call aloud for Christ to help us to not take what He has separated unto Himself and mix it with the temple of the world. May it never be. May we not prostitute ourselves in such a manner. May we walk worthy of our calling. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Let us take and drink. O oh Lord Christ, we do look forward to your return. We pray that in the meantime we would be up and doing good by the power of your Holy Spirit, that when you return you would find us as faithful stewards of that which you have assigned us, and not wasting our time in pharisaical distractions, or distractions of the Pharaoh, rather. We pray, Christ, that for those who are wrestling hard with sin, who are feeling beaten up by the work of the devil, I pray, Lord, that you would refresh them with the knowledge that you have called them to be your sons and daughters. I pray, Lord, that they would be reaffirmed within that identity and that they would act out of it. I pray, Lord, that you would even gather your body around such people, encouraging and stirring one another up to good works, that we would finish the race that you've given to us. O oh, Lord, deliver us from evil. In the name of Christ, amen. 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 Let's stand and close our service with song.
now receive the Lord's benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen.